The problem with committing a perfect murder is that to everyone except the killer, the crime is unknown. A body or bodies yet to be discovered, there has been no police investigation, no manhunt, no forensic detection, nor is there any interest from the newspapers and the general public. The killer has had no recognition, no credit for his work and no satisfaction in seeing his crime baffle the country's finest detectives. There is no glory gained and no victory in avoiding capture. So, how do you commit a perfect murder and get away with it? This was the dilemma facing a 19-year-old poet in the summer of 1951 when he decided to telephone a Sunday newspaper. In crime fiction, it is often the norm for a reporter to be on the spot as quickly as the police. Often they discover the vital clue that leads to the arrest and occasionally he presents the police with the wanted man, complete with sufficient evidence to convict him. In reality, it didn't happen that way, certainly not in 1950s England. The police and the press each had their own jobs and any reporter attempting to undertake private detective work while the police were actively investigating a criminal case would soon find himself in serious trouble. Over the years there have been a number of cases where a newspaper reporter has helped detectives to solve the investigation, but today's episode of Tales from the Hangman's Record must surely be one of the most unique, as rather than the reporter searching for the killer, the killer came to him. It was on Thursday, 9th of August 1951, when a man called the London Bouverie Street offices of the News of the World Sunday newspaper to report his find. He asked to be put through to the crime desk and when connected told him he had found a body and that it looked like a murder. He told the reporter his name was Lenny and he had discovered the body of a woman in Nottingham and she had been strangled. He said he had yet to inform the police and offered them an exclusive story if they were paying a large sum of money. While the journalist kept him talking, another called the police, who hurried to the scene, a call box in Nottingham in the East Midlands of England, and questioned the man. He gave his name as Herbert Leonard Mills, a 19-year-old unemployed dispatch clerk who lived with his grandparents at 174 Mansfield Street in the Sherwood district of Nottingham. Asked where he had made the discovery, Mills led them to an orchard at Sherwood Vale, known locally as a jungle, where he showed them the body concealed in a culvert several feet deep. It was the second woman's body discovered that year in the county, after Florence Weatherall had been found strangled at Limby in February. The police investigation was still going ahead, with Scotland Yard called in, and it was initially thought that the two cases may have been connected. Taken to the mortuary, the body was soon identified as that of Mabel Tattershaw, a 48-year-old housewife from Nottingham who had been reported missing from home six days earlier. From her injuries it appeared she had been battered to death, but under a post-mortem carried out by Professor James Webster, it was found that the cause of death was strangulation. This also suggested that this murder and the one from February might be linked. As he had found the body, Mills was thoroughly questioned, medically examined and scrapings with fingernails and fingerprints taken. But with nothing at this stage to connect him to the woman, he was allowed to leave Leanside Police Station where he had been taken for questioning. The police later issued a description of a limping man who they would like to interview in connection with the murder, for murder they now knew that it was. Mills himself suffered from a club foot and walked with an obvious limp. No sooner had he left the station, he was approached by a journalist looking for his story, but sensing they were onto a scoop, the News of the World offered Mills a good price for an exclusive. Mills telephoned the newspaper and spoke to Norman Jock Ray, a 54-year-old heavily built Scotsman, pretty much a household name for crime scoops with the best-selling Sunday newspaper since the mid-1930s. On the following day, Ray arrived in Nottingham and got Mills to write an account of what it was like to find a body. In his own words, Mills then wrote the following. (music) 
I suppose I'm a quiet, reserved sort of person. At least, that's what those who know me always say. I don't like crowds very much, or most things that other people like. I'd sooner read poetry and try to write it in some quiet spot than mix with any crowd. I like Shelley, Burns, Tennyson and Keats. Books on beauty, you might say, and I'm quite happy to be left alone with them to try to write as they did. Yet yeah, funny, isn't it? I like crime stories too, and murders if there's a preference. That's the irony of my running into murder shortly after writing a sonnet. Perhaps it sounds a queer mixed up story, like something out of Graham Greene's Brighton Rock. You may have seen the film or read the book. But it happened all right, too true it happened. I'd like to tell you the story of the odd day in my life because I'm never likely to forget it, and it just shows what can happen to a man when he least expects it. It's not everyone who runs into a murder when he's wondering whether his verses are good or bad. But I'm running on too fast, let's start at the beginning. I live with my grandparents in an ordinary street in Nottingham, and they're ordinary people. Nothing much happens in our street, no excitement, no glamour, nothing to lift the street or the people out of routine. Myself, I've never been out of England. London is as far as I've got. This may sound a boring life, but it isn't. I've lived in Nottingham all my days, but I'm not bored. You simply cannot be bored if you read and are young enough not to know where you are going. I'm like that. And now to that morning. It was a nice summer morning, bright and sunny, though with a threat of rain. The birds were singing. I had a sonnet in mind, it had been buzzing through my brain as I lay in bed, and I wished to get it down on paper. So I went off for a stroll, with my book of Shelley under my arm, and a pencil and notebook in my pocket. I walked up Winchester Street towards Woodthorpe Park, lost in thought. I know every inch around Woodthorpe and Sherwood. I wanted peace and quiet to write my sonnet, and I thought I would go to the orchard adjoining the park. I like that spot because it's very lonely and peaceful, and I can relax. It's very well wooded, wild if you like, with fruit trees, long brown stringy grass, and clustering brambles, and only one main track. Little paths lead off from this track, but I don't think people use them. Come to think of it, I don't think many folk use the orchard anyway. I've seen it described as a lover's haunt, but that's just nonsense. It's a very lonely spot, even for lovers, though I don't think it's eerie. I strolled through the orchard thinking of my sonnet, then I sat down to write it. The sun went in as I finished the last line. The sky clouded and it started to rain. The orchard isn't a very nice place when it's raining. The water drips through the trees, the long coarse grass reaches up your legs. Then, to a nervous person, it could be eerie. I put my verse in my pocket and walked into a clearing. Suddenly, I caught sight of a necklace of coloured plastic beads lying on the damp grass by the side of a fissure about four feet deep. I stooped to pick it up and as I straightened, I saw something white below me in the fissure. It was the body of a woman. The white I had glimpsed was the left side of her face, very white and pale it looked, seemingly dead. The body was lying face downwards, with the feet drawn up, one higher than the other. I felt stunned, but it is strange the things one notices at such a time. The woman was wearing lyle stockings and a coat, a rather shabby coat, was thrown over her from thigh to shoulder. She was wearing a plum-coloured print dress, rather shabby. She had brown, well-worn shoes but it was the white of the face that held my attention most of all. As I stood staring down, I put the beads into my pocket in an automatic action. I remember thinking that the woman must have lain there for several days. I started wondering what I should do. I recalled all the murder stories I'd ever read and how no one should ever touch a body until the police arrived. I did not touch this body. I did not go down to the fissure. Some reports said the woman's head had been badly battered, but I saw nothing of it, just a little blood under the nose. I felt a little unnerved. I wanted to leave the spot. I looked around, scared that someone might still be lurking around. All I could hear was the shout of children on the swings and roundabouts on the other side of the road. Then I left quickly, and on the way home I sat on a bank to think. I thought for an hour, and I read Shelley's Ode to Death. What should I do? I suppose I should have gone to the police straight away, but I didn't. I thought of the news of the world, and I went to the kiosk to telephone London to ask the newspaper's advice. I tried to keep calm, but didn't feel very calm inside. It was the first dead body I had seen, and I was shaken. After I'd taken the police to see the body, 
I drove to the police station to tell them all I knew. I gave them the necklace I had found and authorised them to take samples of blood from my car and fingernail purrings to prove that I was not involved in any way. I didn't mind. Why should I? I had nothing to fear. So, that's the story of the day in which I met murder. I hope such a thing never happens to me again. I am all for peace and quiet. Poetry and murder don't mix. Over the next fortnight, Mills kept in regular contact with Norman Ray. And with each interview, Mills gave more and more information. The two men talked about his life, his betting strategies, how he had won and subsequently lost thousands of pounds gambling, and also his love of poetry. Convinced by now that Mills was the actual killer, Ray asked him if he wanted to make a further statement, and suggested Mills, as a skilled writer, would like to pen the exclusive story for the newspaper. And besides finding the body, he could tell the News of the World readers more about his life and poetry. It was too much of an offer to turn down for the vain poet, and when Mills agreed, Ray raced to Nottingham, driven there by the newspaper's chauffeur. A meeting was arranged at the Black Boy Hotel in the city. Mills was waiting for Ray in the hotel lobby when he arrived. Mills's father, John, was also present at the introduction, and when his son told him he was there under his own free will and knew what he was doing, he then left them to record the interview. The statement which he wrote on hotel notepaper was later deemed as nothing short of sensational. Ray again asked Mills if he wanted to make the statement, adding, If this statement is to be the truth about the murder, will you make it perfectly clear you are doing it entirely of your own free will, that I have warned you if it contains anything material to the murder, I will take your statement and yourself to the city police headquarters. Mills said that it was, and he would go to see Superintendent Ellington, head of Nottingham CID, and in charge of the investigation after he had finished the statement. Shortly before midnight, Mills picked up his pen and began to write. It took an hour and he wrote in silence. Ray got him to sign each page and when Mills finished, Ray said he would take it to Superintendent Ellington in the morning if it was true. Mills said it was and went to bed in a room at the hotel the newspaper had booked for him. In the statement, Mills tells of the meeting and subsequent murder of Mabel Tattershaw on Friday evening, August the 3rd. On the previous evening, Mabel Tattershaw had gone to the Roxy Cinema with a friend and lodger. While they were there, the lodger noticed Mrs Tattershaw was whispering to a man sat next to her. That man was Lenny Mills. During the brief interaction, they agreed to meet up on the following day. Mills had stated that after talking to Mabel Tattershaw, he saw in her a victim for his perfect murder, and for that reason, and that reason alone, he decided to kill. On the Friday evening, Mrs Tattershaw, whose husband was currently serving a term of imprisonment in Lincoln Jail for shop breaking, prepared to go out, taking some pains over her appearance, even making the unusual step of putting makeup on. She left home at 97 Longmead Drive at just before 6 that evening, and when she failed to return home by Saturday afternoon, the police were notified. After describing the meeting in the cinema, the statement continued. I had always considered the possibility of the perfect crime, murder. I am very much interested in crime. He was my opportunity. I had been more successful. No motive, no clue. Why, if I had not reported finding the body, I should not have been connected in any manner whatsoever. I am quite proud of my achievement. Seeing the possibility of putting my theory into practice, I consented to meeting her on the morrow. I met her on the following day, Friday, August the 8th. Mills was wrong on this point, it was the 3rd of August, not the 8th. Mills mentioned that as they headed towards Sherwood Vale, he spotted a neighbour and an old school friend who both recognised him. Continuing his statement, he said that as they reached the orchard, she took off her coat and lay down. Noticing the beads around her neck, he asked if he could have them. I thought they might interfere with my little crime and my intentions, he noted. She brought the beads from round her neck and gave them me. I tied them. She was a very simple woman. She said she was cold. I had not interfered with her in any way, nor did I. I covered her with her own coat, then my own coat. She had her eyes closed. I put on a pair of gloves. I knelt with my knees on her shoulders. 
The cloaks were placed upon her so she would not clutch or gather any thread with her fingernails. I was rather pleased. I think I did rather well. The strangling itself was quite easily accomplished. I am right-handed and applied most pressure on the right side of her neck. I examined the contents of her pockets which I replaced. I slid her down the bank, covered the coat over her and then left. Arriving at my grandparents at, I think, 9.20pm. Concluding his statement, Mills said he waited for the discovery of the body and wanting to see the frustration of the police when they were unable to solve his murder. Several days elapsed and tired of waiting, he rang the newspaper. On the following morning, Mills maintained his statement was true and he fully realised the implications. Norman Ray accompanied Lenny Mills to the police headquarters presenting the statement to Superintendent Ellington. The detective cautioned Mills asked if the statement was in his own writing and whether the wording was his own. Mills said that it was and he was charged with murder. Herbert Mills appeared in the Magistrates Court at Nottingham Guild Hall on the following day where he was remanded in custody for one week to allow the Chief Constable time to consult with the Director of Public Prosecutions on the matter. Taken to Lincoln Jail, he was initially housed in the same wing where William Tattershaw Mabel's 53-year-old husband and a petty thief was serving his sentence after being charged with breaking into a cinema in Derby and with theft of jars of marmalade from a Nottingham co-op store. Once authorities became aware of the connection, Tattershaw was moved to a different prison. When Mills appeared in court again a week later, Mr F.D. Berry for the prosecution was ready to present his case. He somewhat cruelly described Mrs Tattershaw as a woman of small significance, unattractive in appearance and very poor. She had a very small circle of friends and lived with her daughter, aged 14, and three lodgers. Another daughter had been taken into care after being abused by a previous lodger. With her husband away, her enjoyment seemed to consist of a visit to a local cinema twice a week. There could be no reason for destroying such an inoffensive person. He outlined the details from the initial phone call to the newspaper to the presenting of the confession to Nottingham Police. After a third of the remand, Mills was arranged to stand trial at the next assizes. As he was detained in custody pending trial, the decomposed body of a missing nurse, Hilda Edwards, was discovered in the Nottingham area. Were the police now looking for a serial killer? By the time Mills appeared in the dock before Mr Justice Byrne at Nottingham Assizes on the 21st of November, the serial killer theory had been discounted. There had been nothing to link Mills to the murder of Mrs Weatherall in February and forensic investigation into the body recently found at Southwell ruled out murder as the cause of death. Herbert Leonard Mills must surely have been one of the strangest characters ever to stand in the dock on a charge of murder. Mr R.C. Vaughan Casey for the prosecution said that the body had been found after a person giving the name of Mills had telephoned a London Sunday newspaper saying that he discovered the body of a woman who had been strangled. Mills had asked payment from a newspaper and over a period of time gave various accounts of what he had found until finally making a full written confession. Professor Webster, the director of the Home Office Laboratory of Birmingham, said there were many injuries to the body some caused before and some after death. She had died undoubtedly from asphyxiation due to manual strangulation. Bruises indicate that before death she was struck, probably by fists. He formed the opinion she had been dead for six days when the body was discovered. Hers found on Mrs Tattershaw's dress were similar in colour and microscopic structure to those on the head of Mills, and fibres found under her nails could have come from the blue suit worn by him. Mills' defence realised the difficulty of the task in hand. His only real hope was to show his client was insane and that the clear, lucid way he had made the written confession were not the workings of a normal, rational person. Richard Ells, QC, described Mills as desperately lonely, hateful boy whose character was a mixture of cruelty and boastfulness. However, the confession, said Mr Elms, was sheer invention, full of bombast and childish vanity. Mills was no sadist, and this was obviously a sadist murder. The confession had the indecent object of making money. 
but the prosecution's case, particularly the confession, was too strong. Mills had boasted he had always considered the possibility of the perfect crime, murder, and was presented with the opportunity. In offering a motive, Mr Vaughan alleged that the main reason for the murder was exhibitionism. And countering any insanity, the prosecution showed how Mills, now realised the implications and seriousness of his actions, had since tried to withdraw everything he admitted to thus far. He now stated he hadn't murdered Mabel as he had claimed, instead he had just found the body. Mills said he had confessed because if he was accused of murder he hadn't committed, he would be put on trial and acquitted, then he could sell his story to the press and it would be worth far more money. It was a gamble with his life and one which he had lost. After judges summing up, it took the jury just 25 minutes to reach a verdict of guilty. Mills smiled as he heard the jury's verdict and was still smiling as the black cap was draped on the wig of Mr Justice Byrne and sentenced to death passed. Mills was returned to Lincoln Jail and placed in the condemned cell. Coincidentally, the last occupant in this cell had been condemned for a murder in 1949 when inmate Kenneth Strickson murdered a matron at Sherwood Borstal, Nottingham. It was just a little over a mile from where Mills had committed his murder. Originally known as Nottingham Bagthorpe Prison, it had been decommissioned in 1930, the building changing to a Borstal, and hence why Mills had been sent to Lincoln for execution. Mills made no appeal against his sentence, so it's simply a case of fixing a date for the execution. The ruling was it was to be carried out on the first day of the week, but not on Monday, after three clear Sundays. Thus, nine o'clock on Tuesday the 11th of December 1951 was fixed, and letters sent out to hangman Albert Pierpoint and his assistant Herbert Ari Allen of Selly Oak, Birmingham. Coincidentally, there were two assistant hangmen named Ari Allen on the list at this time, with the namesake Manchester Publican having almost 10 years seniority. Waiting execution, Mills refused to see his father and stepmother, and when visited by his grandfather, he said he would prefer cake to prayers. Herbert Mills was hanged according to law, and at the inquest held that afternoon, the doctor present at the execution reported that it took 20 minutes for Mills' heart to stop beating. However, the postmaster confirmed that Mills' neck had been broken and he had not died of asphyxiation. Herbert Mills was the 15th person Albert Pierpoint hanged in 1951, the only year in his career in which Pierpoint carried out every execution that took place. It was the first time a hangman had done this since his Uncle Tom officiated at every execution in 1938. It was also the last time Herbert Allen participated in an execution. The reasons for him quitting as an assistant after just two years, during which time he helped at eight executions, are confusing. Sid Durnley recorded in his 1989 biography, The Hangman's Tale, that Pierpont had told him Allen's both had warned that selling ice cream and assisting at hangings didn't mix, and he had to quit if he wished to continue in his day job. I've also seen evidence that Alan may have been dismissed after stealing Mills' pullover following this execution. But there's one other clue that may have contributed to Alan leaving the list. On the official LPC4 form, filled in after every execution to record the particulars of the condemned and the conduct of the hangmen, in relation to Alan, where it is noted, does he have the mental and physical capacity for the duty of executioner, it is noted unusually as just fur. Any time murder is committed, it is a sad business. But when one is committed purely so that someone can see if they are capable of committing the perfect murder, seems all the more dreadful. And Herbert Mills deserves little, if any, pity. Would Mills got away with committing a perfect murder? I think it's unlikely, as he even admitted in his statement he had been seen in the company of the murdered woman by two people who knew him well, and this evidence would surely have come to the knowledge of the detectives. Mills would have been traced to the cinema, then a check of his alibi would have left him unable to account for the time of the murder. Then, of course, there was a forensic evidence mentioned in court and linking him to the scene of the crime. Fleet Street's murder gang in the years either side of the Second World War often used highly questionable methods to attract readers. 
The news of the world in particular was noted for its use of what became known as checkbook journalism. Two years later, Norman Ray tried to meet and secure an exclusive with the infamous Notting Hill serial killer John Christie while he was on the run from the police. Never far from controversy, the news of the world finally closed in July 2011 after 168 years following a phone hacking scandal. It had remained a best-selling newspaper to the end, although as all newspaper sales declined over the decades, it never recaptured its circulation in 1951 of 8.4 million. This was in no small way due to Norman Ray, the top Fleet Street crime reporter in a time when shocking murder stories sold newspapers. But there was nothing to question or fault in Ray's methods that summer of 1951 in bringing a cold-blooded killer to justice. Thank you for watching and listening to this video. If you've enjoyed it, can you please press like and if you don't already, can I ask you to subscribe to the channel. Check out my website, stevefielding.com, where you can find links to all the other videos in this series, information on all my books and order copies of The Hangman's Record and my two new paperbacks from the online shop. Do you agree that justice was done in this case? Use the comments below for your thoughts and suggestions for other cases to feature in the Tales from the Hangman's Record series. So then, until next time, goodbye.